name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And we'll continue with our hymn of the month. I think since it's a uh, smaller crowd, we'll just do stanzas one, one, three, one, three, and five. So just the just the odd stanzas, stanzas one, three, and five. And it's uh, before you, Lord, we bow. Before you, Lord, we bow. Lord, God, who reigns above. that 
all good things and creation itself, especially creation itself, belongs to God. Um, you, you have this uh, line in the first stanza, our God who reigns above and rules the world below, boundless in power and love, and then in stanza three, may every mountain height, each vale and forest green shine in your words pure light and its rich fruits be seen. May every tongue be tuned to praise and join to raise a grateful song. And I think, uh, you know, our, our world, really, for the last, like, easily 500 years or so, has become very scientific-minded, which is not necessarily a bad thing, right? I mean, I'm grateful for science and, and for some of the things that science has shown us, but true, I mean, true science is is uh, you know, studying God's creation and, and drawing conclusions from it. Um, but I think that as our world has become more and more scientific based or more and more um, kind of based on like logic and um, kind of trying to explain things without any kind of spirituality that we tend to think that things will happen without God, right? So, especially this this line that I'm thinking of here is, may every mountain height, each bell and forest green, shine in your words pure light and its rich fruits be seen, right? We just assume that because of science um, that plants will produce fruit, right? The plants will grow and that they'll um, produce seed and the seed will, will grow other plants and that they'll fruit and that they'll produce things, right? And, it, you know, if you've grown a garden before, you kind of know that, yeah, as long as uh, things get sun and water and the bugs stay away and so forth, that uh, these things do happen. But, even though those things can have a scientific e explanation, so, you know, sun and chlorophyll and leaves soaking up things and roots soaking up water, um, you know, I, I probably remember better if I watched the Magic School Bus again and <laughs> learned that, uh, learned all about it, but um, it's not just those scientific things that caused that to happen, right? It's actually that God, one, created it to work that way, and then God also sustains it to work that way, right? Then without God, uh, there would be no fruiting of the seed. Without God, there would be no mountain heights or vales and forests green. And the reason that their fruits can be seen, even to unbelievers, is because they shine in God's words, pure light, right? And, and if you think about the creation narrative in Genesis 1, that God speaks creation into existence, right? By God's word, the word is powerful and it does what it says it's going to do. And so whenever he says, let there be trees according to their kinds, that bear fruit according to their kinds, that these things actually happen. Um, and we always need to keep that in mind that everything that exists only exists because God allows it and God sustains it, right? We can't, it, it's not um, a deistic universe. So deism was this thought in the, starting really more in the 1800s, some in the 1700s, that of God as a clockmaker, right? That he created the universe and set it in motion and then kind of walked away. But that's not what Christians believe, right? Christians believe that God is still active in creation, working in history, working in time, sustaining these things for our, for our benefit. Um, so anyway, that's what I was thinking about with the hymn. In the Bible memory work, any questions or comments on that? In the Bible memory work, or catechism memory work, and Bible memory work. We have the sixth petition of the Lord's Prayer. Lead us not into temptation. 
And this is uh, one of my favorite petitions because it's so clear here that when we pray, we're praying for things that God has already promised and that God already gives. And prayer, that, that I mean, that's true all throughout the Lord's Prayer. Um, and, and Luther will point this out in his explanations, as we've seen, that God's will is done certainly without our prayer. Right? God's kingdom comes certainly without our prayer. God will give daily bread even without our prayer, even to wicked people. But especially in this one, lead us not to temptation, uh, Luther just starts out, God tempts no one. And so why would we pray for these things? Right? What's, what's the purpose of praying for things that already are going to happen or already exist? And there's a number of reasons. I think, um, one, God commands it, right? Jesus says, pray like this. This So so he wants to hear our prayer. But diving a little deeper into that, too, this is the whole analogy of um, a husband and wife, right? When they get married, they say their vows. They say, I, I love you to each other on their wedding day. Do they stop saying I love you throughout the marriage? Right. Um, they, they shouldn't, right? <laughs> Might be in trouble if they did. Right. Um, they continue to communicate, right? They continue to grow in that love with one another. And the same is true with us and God, as, as the church is the bride of Christ, that we continue to talk to one another. And we continue to say to one another things that we know are true. Right? God speaks to us things that we know are true. He can like we could just receive the Lord's Supper once and be like, yep, I got the forgiveness of sins. Got Jesus' body and blood, right? Now I don't have to go for another, you know, five years. We could go, right? We could say that, but that, that would not be right. Because God wants to continually shower us with his gifts. He wants to continue to bless us. And, and he wants to continue to hear from us, right? And he commands us, he wants us uh, to pray to him. Um, pray without ceasing. And so we pray um, that we would not be tempted or be led into temptation. And uh, Luther returns to this threefold idea of places that can be tempting the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. He also says that in the third article or the third petition of the Lord's Prayer, um, God's will is done whenever he breaks and hinders every plan and purpose of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. So he's kind of returning to that there. Um, as well, which is a helpful diagnostic of, okay, where is temptation coming from? Is it coming from the devil? Is it coming from the world? Is it coming from within my own sinful nature? And then he also gives another kind of threefold uh, diagnostic here of things that we can be tempted to. False belief, despair, and other great shame and vice. And I think that's helpful especially because we, when we think about temptation, I think at least for me, um, when I hear temptation, I just think about, like, personal sins, I guess. Uh, you know, like, basically vices. Uh, as he says, great shame and vice. I think about vices. But there are other things we can be tempted to that are equally sinful and equally bad. Uh, for one, false belief, right? If, if someone is tempted to false doctrine, that is um, a, a wicked and evil thing. And then also despair. Um, that I, I I tend to think when I, you know, as I've counseled people and uh, talked to people over the years in ministry, that people are generally tempted towards some sort of pride or some sort of despair, right? And ultimately, they kind of loop around and they're two sides of the same coin because uh, they're both focused inward, right? Pride is focused inward, and despair is focused inward. Uh, and Augustine described sin as being curved inward. Right? That was Augustine's definition of sin, is that we're no longer curved outward toward God and our neighbor, but we're curved inward toward ourselves. And um, But despair especially is something that people really struggle with today. Uh, I, I, there's a lot of people who... Um, describe themselves as lonely and depressed. And I, you know, I think like psychology visits and uh, antidepressants are like at an all-time high today. So there's a lot of despair in our world. Uh, but we, we, but we pray here that we would be, not be led into despair. 
that, that we would retain the hope of the gospel, right? And as Luther says, although we are attacked by these things, we pray that we may finally overcome them and win the victory, right? That there is a hope and there is a victory in Jesus Christ and in his resurrection. And we can go from being turned inward to being turned outward again uh, through, the, through the blood of Christ. So that's a, that's a wonderful thing. All right, any, any questions on that? Comments? Um, are we going to start? Um, yeah, we're starting, we're starting the prophets. We finished up, more or less, good enough for me, the kings of Judah. Okay? So, congratulations. We've made it through all the kings of Israel and Judah. Um, and probably the, in my opinion, what people struggle with the most in reading the Bible is getting through Kings and Chronicles and this divided kingdom and the Jehoshaphats and Jehoahazes and Joshams and Joshams and all the rest of them. Um, we've made it through all of that. And I hope that uh, we all have a better knowledge of the Old Testament, how it fits together now, that we've made it through that. Now that we've gone, we've made it uh, through both of those, we are going to backtrack a little bit, just like we did with Israel. So if you remember with Israel, what we had done is we had gone through, if you have your, your chart of Bible history here, um, we, had, we had gone, we, we started with Israel with this right side of this chart, and we went through all the kings, and then we had gone back through and went through some of these prophets as well, and um, the especially the pre-exilic prophets. And now we've gone through all the Judah kings, and what we're going to do is we're going to go back through the Judah prophets, the prophets of Judah, um, which by and large are books of the Bible. All right, so uh, that is what we're going to be focusing on, and that will actually bring us basically through the rest of the Old Testament. So we'll get through the prophets of Judah that prophesied uh, during the time of Judah in the divided kingdom before the Babylonian exile. And then we'll, uh, then we'll also do the post-exilic prophets together as well, so the prophets after the exile um, in both Israel and Judah. So hopefully that makes sense. That's kind of where we're at. Um, but all of that to say, we're not that far away from being done with the Old Testament. So it's only taken me three years uh, to get there, but uh, that, that's pretty good for only once a week, honestly, for an hour or so, uh, less than an hour mostly. So, uh, the first prophet we're going to look at is the prophet Joel. Now, just since I, I did have that sheet out, um, some of these things are a little bit difficult to date. So, we're, we're going to try and go in chronological order. But, some of these things, uh, there is no widespread agreement on when these prophets prophesied. Because we have prophets like Joel and Obadiah, for instance, that don't give certain, they don't give any time reference for when they are prophesying. We, um, they, they talk about Judah, but they, they don't give any particular time reference, and they're not referenced in the Kings or Chronicles particularly either. And so it's hard to put an exact date to it. Um, and I actually, this sent me down a rabbit trail when I was preparing for today because I was trying to figure out what the best chronological order is. And I realized that there was actually too much research to be done for this one Bible study. So I was like, I just got to pick one and get one there. So I'm picking Joel. I think Joel probably comes before Obadiah. Um, this sheet that you have that, I, that I've given you before that you might have. It, it does list Obadiah before Joel, um, but you can even see there that Obadiah has a question mark. So I think we're going to start with Joel and then do Obadiah. I think Joel is earlier. Um, some people want to make Joel a post-exilic prophet, but I think that's because they're trying to explain away too much of the Bible. But um, we can talk about that a little bit more. Uh, but anyway, you might remember actually, uh, some of Joel might sound pretty familiar to some of you, because um, in Advent of 2021, so a couple years ago, uh, in December, um, I preached through Joel for the Advent weeks. 
So it might sound, once we start talking about it, I'm hoping it sounds a little bit familiar to you. Um, but, but that's where we're at. So Joel, by the way, in your Bibles, is um, after Hosea and before Amos. So if you get to the Minor Prophets in the back of the Old Testament, and you're kind of flipping through the Minor Prophets, and you see Amos or Hosea, uh, then you'll be able to find it. So if you uh, look at, if you see, let's see, what's before Hosea? Daniel. So you should be able to find Daniel um, and then Hosea, and then it's Joel. So, uh, but it's only three chapters, so it's not a long prophecy. And uh, as we already said, the time in which this is written is not exactly clear. And Joel is interesting in that way, particularly that one of the reasons that it's not clear when it's written is because Joel does not go over any specific sins um, of Judah. So... Joel uh, speaks very broadly about the problems in Judah. And, and basically, his prophecy is about the punishment that's coming and that the forgiveness that is awaiting them in God and the restoration. But he really never says why they deserve this punishment. Uh, he just basically says it's time to repent. And I kind of like that because it makes it very applicable. That it doesn't really matter in some sense what the sin is. What matters is that it needs to be repented of. And he also just assumes that in that way that people know what their sins are. And I, I think that is true to an extent. I, so there's this kind of pet peeve in, in preaching that I have, and I'm probably guilty of it sometimes, but I've heard a lot of sermons that because of the, basically because of like the Lutheran distinction of law and gospel, and which is a good distinction, and which, in which a lot of pastors are, are trying to convict people of their sin, which is a good goal to have in preaching, right, to convict people of their sin, that they will make up sins as like examples, but then basically like accuse everyone of committing that sin. I don't know if you've ever heard a sermon like this, where it's like, here's a sin, and like, describe this in the detail, like, you are guilty of this. But like, I don't, not, not everybody struggles with the same sins, right? that different people have different sins that they struggle with. And, um, yeah, there's just been sermons I've heard where it's like, I'm being accused of something I haven't done. <laughs> and uh, that's that's not fair. <laughs> so I, I try and be careful of that. I try and kind of be like Joel in that way when I preach, where hopefully it is broad-reaching enough where it's applicable, like, to your life now and then if there is a sin that I name as an example of a potential sin that it's not framed in a way where it's like you have necessarily done this right but anyway that's kind of a an aside yeah Steve maybe <clears throat> maybe the preachers are referring to the corporate sin of the whole nation you know as, as a whole nation we, we've done those sins right no that's a good point that, that's a good point that there is a collective sin that we possess, right? At, as sons of Adam, and um, like we talked about with those king, with the kings, that there's like Judah has collective sin, right? But anyhow, so I like Joel here because he he just simply says um, like it's time to repent, and he himself actually and this is pretty rare in the Bible, uh, actually. But it is something that I do hear preachers today do a lot of, and, and I do myself sometimes, which is that he includes himself in the guilty party, right? So most of the time in the Bible, interestingly enough, like the prophets and or Paul in the, in the New Testament, 
uh, generally speaks in the second person. It's like you. And I think that is uh, more powerful preaching when the preacher is preaching to the second person, not, not, excuse me, not just first person plural. But um, Joel speaks often in the first person plural. And, and he will um, include himself in, so, I mean, some of it's in the second person, no doubt. But there are times where he includes himself um, in, in the repentance. And uh, that, is a, that is also a powerful thing that Joel does, specifically because it is different than a lot of the other prophets. Okay, okay so uh, a couple more kind of who, what, when, where, why questions about Joel. So I think uh, one of the things about Joel is that if you have a Bible with cross-references, and if you don't, you can just uh, go to BibleGateway.com and turn on the cross-reference option and read through Joel and look at the bottom of the page. That Joel is constantly either quoting or potentially being quoted, and I'll talk about that in a second, other pro with other prophets. And he is also used uh, in the New Testament. We'll talk about this specifically in Acts 2, where Peter gives a very extensive quote from the end of chapter 2 of Joel. So Joel 2 and Acts 2. And uh, this is one of the reasons that some people want to date him later, is that he seems to have a knowledge of the other prophets. But I would say that I, so I, I think an earlier dating of Joel, I think he's one of the earliest prophets, and I think that other prophets had a knowledge of him. <laughs> so I, I don't really see how you can prove that one way or the other, right? So I mean, I'm, I'm not like tied to that as a point of doctrine, but um, I think other prophets are drawing from him rather than he's drawing from other prophets. So you can make that argument either way, but the, the point is that there's a lot of similarities between Joel and and, and things that you will find in Isaiah and things that you will find in Jeremiah and things that you'll find in some of the other minor prophets. Um, so if you if you do happen to have a cross-reference Bible, you can just skim through uh, looking at those cross-references and see over and over again Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, 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 Jeremiah, Jeremiah, Revelation, Proverbs, Isaiah, um, that he's got... He's, he's definitely very much in tune with other scripture. And, uh, of course, we always say we want scripture to interpret scripture. So, uh, Joel is a great case study in that. Yeah, go ahead. On your other sheet here, one that looks like this. Uh, has, yeah, what's that one? It has Joel, like it has the return of Jerusalem, and then uh, Haggai, Zechariah, Joel, and Malachi. Yeah, so, okay. Um, yeah, these are just things I downloaded from the internet, of course, so, you know, they're not um, perfect, but, uh, so some people do give Joel, and this is a more modern thing, so basically, in modern theology, uh, after the advent of, like, liberalism within the study of the Bible, which takes a critical approach to the scriptures, and is trying to explain like the exact historicity using logic of how the scriptures came to be um, and more minimizing the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Um, the prophets especially tend to get pushed with later dates than traditionally held. And the reason for that is because Joel will talk about the return from exile. And so, because he talks about the return from exile, the logical, historical, modern response is, well, he must have already seen it. But the traditional Holy Spirit-inspired response is, he saw it in the future, because he's a prophet. Yeah. Right. So again, I mean, you can't prove it one way or the other, because he does not have a date. The only date, the only time reference we get is that... Um, he had 
seen the reign of Jehoshaphat. And if you see, Jehoshaphat's like the fourth king in Judah, right? So um, we know he was probably after that at some point. Um, I looked at the date, interestingly, uh, listed in the Lutheran Study Bible, because the Lutheran Study Bible has these uh, introductions to the books of the Bible that are actually pretty helpful for the most part. And I, I was just wondering, like, okay, what's the Lutheran Study Bible date it? And the Lutheran Study Bible dates it at, like, very specifically between uh, 848 and 800. I was like, that's super specific, seeing as no one agrees. Um, so I guess it's just a guess. But, yeah, they, they did it somewhere just, like, within, at, right, like, right after the reign of Jehoshaphat, basically. Within the 50 years after Jehoshaphat. So uh, that's kind of an interesting thought. I mean, I don't know, like, why specifically that. And... I guess, I mean, in some ways that does make the most sense that if he mentions Jehoshaphat, that then he would um, be writing pretty soon after that reign. So, anyway, I, I don't know. But, yeah, that, 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 so that's my guess. Is My best guess is that it's sometime, you know, in the 800s. Uh, probably in the latter part of the 800s, but going towards the 700s, so, because um, we're counting down, you can see, right? So anyway, that's, uh, that's that. That's the who, what, when, where, why. We'll talk about the book now. Any, any questions on, on who is Joel and dating and such? Okay. So, we got three chapters. We got chapter it's one, two, and three. And chapter one, uh, so there's chapter one is this kind of immediate disaster that's upon Judah. And then chapter two is gonna be a future disaster. But these things are connected, the immediate disaster shows the nature of the future disaster, and he's going to refer back to the immediate disaster. But the immediate disaster in chapter 1 is all about these locusts that are coming. And this is kind of a, a fun thing. So when uh, the land is laid waste because of these locusts in this immediate disaster, you can start in verse 4. What the chewing locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the crawling locust has eaten. What the crawling locust left, the consuming locust has eaten. And then, um, if you keep reading down, you find out that uh, all of the earth, right? And this is kind of what we were talking about in the, in the end of the month, with the idea that God is the one that allows the plants and the, and the creation to bloom and blossom is that the land is cut off specifically um, with the vine and the fig tree and the branches, right? That the, the land itself is just laid waste. So verse 7, he laid waste my vine, he ruined my fig tree, he stripped it bare and has thrown it away. And so we have this um, total destruction of the land. And this is kind of this... Um, this prophetic understanding of disaster. And you can see how it fits, by the way, with what we talked about last week, which was the destruction of Judah, right? When Babylon came in, uh, killed the, the women and children, right? Laid the, the land bare so that the land of Judah could have its Sabbath rest, as we talked about. Um, this is the kind of thing that's happening. This disaster has come upon the people. Uh, the land is laid waste. And what's the response to this immediate problem that they have? And uh, he, so first he calls for lament, that we would, which lament, verse 8, lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. So lament like a, like a young man. Uh, virgin who's just lost her husband, which is an interesting analogy. Um, so 
where we're called to lament, we're called to pray, uh, to be honest with God about our, our sorrow and about our despair. Um, but then, uh, as we continue on, and he continues to go through the land being laid waste, the barley, the vine again, the fig tree again, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree, the apple tree, all the trees of the field over there. Uh, but then verse 13, and this is, this is interesting, gird yourselves and lament you priests, well you who minister before the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth, you who minister to my God. Notice that first person there. For the grain offering and the drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast, call the sacred assembly, gather the elders, and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God, and cry out to the Lord. So, what's interesting to me here is that he emphasizes that this is a problem for the church. And specifically the priests to deal with. That, of course, the reason for this disaster, the reason for the locust, is because of the sin of Judah. Right? We need that the Judah needs to repent of what it's done. But Who is called to do the repentance? Who's called to get on their knees and pray? It's the church. The church is called to pray and to consecrate a fast, to call a sacred assembly, right? And we saw this in all, all the kings as well. That what are the kings called to do? They're called to return to the Lord. They're called to uh, institute that the church should celebrate it's sacraments of the day to celebrate the Passover. Remember the Josiah. Whenever they find the book of the law, what what is the, what is the thing that changes in Judah? They stop celebrating the pagan sacraments and they start worshiping like Christians again. And the worship of Christians is the thing that carries them into the way that they should go. Right? We talked about these three rites that are needed for the kings of Israel and Judah. The right word, the right worship, and the right prayer. Right? Well, the church is what provides that. And so um, I think when we think about, like, oh, our society is going to hell in a handbasket. And, um, oh, our society is so pagan now. That one of the things we should do is not just sit there on our high horses and say, oh, these wicked people, too bad they aren't Christian. Guess I'm just going to be Christian over here in the corner by myself and be sad about it all. Then we should get on our hands and knees and repent and pray. Right? That the disaster of the land is not just a sign of the wickedness of the people and then that's that. But it is an encouragement to Christians. And I mean, I'm convicted by this, especially as a pastor, that the ministers of God are called to call a fast, to call a sacred assembly, to gather the elders into the house of the Lord, and to cry out to the Lord. Right? So, um, this is, is, is good for us to think about that uh, even in a pagan society, it is for the church to pray and to mourn and to lament and to pray for mercy, right? Because the pagans aren't going to pray for mercy, right? <laughs> they don't have a God to pray to. And, and so we, we have to pray for mercy to the Lord. All right. So that's kind of chapter one. Any questions on chapter one? Okay. Chapter two. Now is this kind of future disaster. And you see in chapter in, uh, verse 1, for the day of the Lord is coming. So we kind of had this preview of this like immediate disaster, which I think, I think, is somewhat metaphorical. I think that the prophecy in Joel 1 is more of a, let's say, generic prophecy, if you will, where he's just kind of describing the reality of what a disaster is. 
and it's it's not what I'm saying is it's not something historically that like had to happen. Um, it's, and it's interesting, by the way, I forgot to say this earlier, but the locust specifically, where else do we see this a locust swarm in the Bible? In, uh, they, they... Yeah, plagues of Egypt, right? When fed with Pharaoh. Exactly. And um, <coughs> God sends that plague on a wicked nation that is not Christian to save his people. Um, but this time it's switched around because in this disaster, and I think this is what Joel is pointing out because I think Joel's drawing on the book of Exodus is that look, what, e what, what, what God sent to Egypt he's going to send to you if you don't repent. Right? You deserve what Pharaoh got. And so that's a, that's a uh, strong condemnation right there in itself. Okay? So then um, chapter 2 so we kind of have this like preview of disaster in chapter 1. Chapter 2, he says, the day of the Lord is coming. Okay, this is verse verse 1. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. Now, this phrase, the day of the Lord, this is probably the most important phrase to know. And, or one of the most important phrases to know in, in the prophets. The day of the Lord is this day of justice, this day of righteousness. And it's the, it's the day when the Lord's going to make everything right. Now, interestingly enough, in the Bible, there ends up not being just one day of the Lord. There ends up being a lot of days of the Lord, um, but they all relate to one another. Okay, so... If we think about this basic definition, the day of the Lord is the day when everything's made right, that's going to be double-edged. Because the day of the Lord when everything is made right means that the wicked people are going to be brought to justice. It means that people are going to be destroyed. It's going to be difficult and rough and hard and uh, there's going to be war. Um, and we're going to see that especially in chapter 3, that the day of the Lord means a war is happening. But it also means that the righteous people, that God's people who he saves, are going to be vindicated. It means that there's going to be a great salvation. So there's a two-sided nature to the day of the Lord. Now, when we read Joel's prophecy, it seems pretty clear that there, one of these days of the Lord but D-O-L, day of the Lord. One of them is obviously what we talked about last week with the Babylonian exile. That when Babylon comes and takes and destroys Judah, that this is one of the days of the Lord. Right? That they've come, that God's wrath is finally carried out. Right? What the prophets have been prophesying over and over and over again throughout Israel's history um, and this is one of the prophecies here, is that this day has come, right? Judah has refused to repent. And this day has come where God is going to carry out his, his righteous wrath and anger against these people. We also have um, other days of, of the Lord. So, when we get to the Pentecost prophecy at the end of chapter 2, we'll talk about this more. But I think both, uh, I mean, there's, there's, there's so many ways you can think about the day of the Lord. I mean, I think, I, I remember preaching this in Advent. I mean, I think uh, the incarnation, Christmas, is one of the days of the Lord, right? Because in, in Christmas, you can see how things are now being made right. That God has taken on human flesh to deal with the sin. Um, but then kind of connected to that also uh, the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. These are days of the Lord. This is the day of the Lord that, that Christ is making everything right. Um, and then obviously as we get to the end of 
chapter 2, we also have Pentecost, where Peter takes this prophecy specifically and applies it to the day of Pentecost. And then finally, um, kind of circling back around from the Babylonian exile, we have the last day, the day when Jesus comes back again, the day of the Lord that we're finally thinking of. And this is really the biggest day of the Lord in that sense, right? The day when Jesus comes back to judge the living and the dead, that is the final day of the Lord. And so uh, this day of the Lord, it's important to realize, I think, um, when the prophets speak in these terms, they're not just talking about one day. It's multifaceted, right? It's, it's referring to the day of the Lord in history, but then also the day of the Lord that's coming. So um, I think you can think about all these, all these things when you're thinking about the day of the Lord. Um, another one would be like the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. That's another big day of the Lord. Or even the return from exile is also, in a sense, a day of the Lord. But we're, we're continuing to pile up meaning as we look at all these different days of the Lord and what they mean. Okay, so uh, chapter 2 prophecy continues with this future destruction now. And it's uh, similar to the destruction of chapter 1, although it's a little bit more war language and a little less uh, nature language. So you had locusts and trees in chapter one now you have um if you're looking at like verse uh four and five uh or three four and five a fire devours before them and behind them a flame burns uh just skipping for a little bit their appearance is like the appearance of horses and like swift steeds so they run with a noise like chariots over mountaintops they leap like a noise of flaming fire that devours the stubble like a strong people set in battle array. So, um, and then going down even further, like verse 7, they climb the wall like men of war. Everyone marches in formation. So um, this is much more a war scene now than a locust scene. Um, but he's kind of using this to describe the locusts. So these aren't just like annoying bugs. These are mighty warriors coming to destroy. Uh, let me just finish up this one part of chapter 2, and then we'll pick up with the Pentecost prophecy next week. So then what, what happens at, after this destruction in chapter 2 is this call to repentance. And 2 verse 13 is the most important verse, I think. So... Um, well, I'll read 12 as well. Now, therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, weeping, and with mourning. And then he says, so rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. That um, what the Lord desires is a change of heart. Right? He doesn't just want this outward repentance where the people say, oh, yeah, we're sorry, but then keep on doing what they're doing. He wants a change of heart. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God. And then we get this true compassion of the Lord. So it's true repentance followed by true compassion. For the Lord is gracious and merciful, abounding in steadfast love. Um, and from here we'll see how the Lord then will change. Um, and, and we'll see this double-edged nature of the day of the Lord. That while the day of the Lord is great destruction... It is also great salvation for those who repent and return to the Lord their God. So he's going to turn this same day from total and utter destruction into salvation. So this, this path from destruction to salvation tied together by repentance is what we're looking at. But we'll pick that back up next week. I know I'm out of time, so um, we'll, we'll pick that up next week and then um, talk about the Pentecost prophecy and about chapter 3. All right, any final questions or comments? All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you that you have given us life on this earth in the time that you have. And we pray that you would lead us to true repentance and faith in you, that your church might cry out for justice and truth and mercy in a world that does not know you. And we pray that you would come to us today to bless us in
in spirit and in truth with your word and your sacrament. We pray this all through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.